In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. So in your bulletins, if you are spiritually sensitive, you'll notice that at the bottom of the left-hand column, that's your little cheat sheet for what I'm about to say. Christ has ascended. Weak. Very weak. Let's try that. No, not truly he's ascended. <laughs> I'm going to try that one more time. Christ has ascended. Yes, I knew it. Okay. So, as I've mentioned to you before, we continue to get this strange sprinkling of young adults throughout the Triangle area calling me up and uh, wanting to learn about the ancient apostolic faith. And this is over the last two, three years. Uh, just last week, we had one such young adult come forward and actually receive chrismation with his Nunatula by his side, uh, Evan, who took the name Dionysios. Tomorrow, I am on the a Zoom call with three or four other young adults. None of them know each other, and they're all, I don't know how, it's puzzling to me why these people are finding orthodoxy. I, you know, don't take me wrong, but... Um, you know, we're less than 1%. As far as a religious group in America, we're less than 1%, the Orthodox. We don't advertise. Our services are, you know, sometimes long and tedious. and it's, Half of it is in ancient Greek. Our calendar is, a third of it is marked by some sort of fasting. So what's the attraction? We have neither the sophistication, nor the organization of the West. There's a story of a young man who was not Christian but wanted to become a Christian. And so he looked into it and he saw that the body of Christ was divided, which is in itself a scandal. But he, saw, he noticed that there was Protestant churches and there's 30,000 divisions of that Protestant church alone. And then there's the Catholic church and then there's the Orthodox church. And so he went to each one, one of the 30,000 of the Protestant churches, one Catholic church and one Orthodox church. In the Protestant church, he experienced great zeal, great joy, Shouting, rock bands, uh, you know, uh, pink balloons, uh, what else, what else, uh, props all over the place. And it was very inspiring. Next week he went to a Catholic church and it was fully in order, on time. You could hear a pin drop during the service. And then the following week he came to an Orthodox church. People were coming and going, in and out, uh, you know, babies crying, people shoving their way in to receive communion, on and, uh, you know, after all this, he went, he approached the Orthodox priest, and he said, how long has your church been in existence? The priest said, 2,000 years. I mean, we're as old as Christianity itself. You know, it is, this is the church. And he said, I want to be Orthodox. The priest said, why? And he said, if this church can survive the way you're running it for 2,000 years, <laughs> God has got to be in that church. <laughs> it seems like orthodoxy does stay afloat by a miracle, as one convert put it, with, in the face of so many struggles and <sighs> tribulations and trials. How many times has the church come out of the shadows after all kinds of abuse and, you know, the, her first 300 years of existence, Mother Church, suffered through Roman persecutions. She endured 400 years of Ottoman rule and I don't know how many generations under communistic and atheistic regimes hell-bent on snuffing her out and shutting her down. So why are these young people attracted 
to a faith that's at times weak, at times appearing, I don't know, embattled. What's the attraction? How are they embracing us against all odds? Well, my friends, I think perhaps it's in her very weakness that she manifests, orthodoxy manifests in her weakness her greatest values and ideals. Purity, poverty, humility, simplicity, forgiveness. And ultimately, ultimately, her theology. It is a, th- uh, it is a theology that is not political. It is a theology that is not moralistic. And it is a theology that doesn't change at the whims of some charismatic individual who reads a Bible verse and says, no, I think we should go this way. It is in her theology and her worship that where orthodoxy demonstrates her greatest sophistication, her greatest organization, her greatest devotion, second to none. To me, as harsh as the outside influences have been over the millennia, seeking to dominate the church and shut her down, it is the forces within Christianity that are more insidious and dangerous. As a priest, as a shepherd, I am not afraid of our people falling into atheism. Our people, it's just innate in them. It's innate in them that they they have faith. You can't take it away. I'm not worried about atheism. I am worried about the distortion of the ancient apostolic faith. That concerns me. In the West, things change fast and furious. And if someone disagrees with you, well, that's all right. We'll start our own church. But in the East, the church goes through great pains. Great pains if there is a disagreement. Even if it's only one letter of a word, like at the First Ecumenical Council. She works out things in council in order to remain one. The very thing our Lord begged for on the night of his betrayal, on the night when he was sweating great drops of blood, let them be one. We heard it in today's gospel lesson. The church commemorates the 318 fathers who attended that first ecumenical council. This is why the church assigned today's gospel lesson, where we heard the Lord's heartfelt prayer, let them be one, because that was the job of these bishop and elders, this uh, divine battalion, as the hymn calls them, this heavy artillery of theologians, as the hymn calls them, to keep the faith whole and intact. The church also selected with great wisdom today's epistle lesson, where St. Paul worries over his flock and warns them, after my departure, savage and fierce wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. These days, I don't worry about persecution from those outside the church, but again and again, I worry about the distortion from those within the church who call themselves Christian, trying to pass it off as a Christianity without the cross, a Christianity without the priesthood, a Christianity without the sacraments, a Christianity without the church, a Christianity where salvation is achieved without effort. When it comes to our young adults, those who grew up in the faith and those who are are wonder-wrapped about it, they are not looking for something new. They are looking for something old. They are not looking for ease in the faith. They're looking for meaning. Our young adults, how I admire you. I want to tell you, It is not flesh and blood that has revealed this ancient apostolic faith to you, but their heavenly Father himself. Now, I had asked, I'm going to ask our young adults to come forward at this time. Some of them were not able to attend because they have uh, some 
COVID or non-COVID symptoms or some variant or something. So some of them are out. Some of them are in another country. But those of you who are here, our young adults, could you please come forward and uh, stand here at the Solea? You too. Now, our ladies in the community, the guys, you know, you can tell when they're in their 40s and 50s, we got it. But the, the ladies, you can't tell because you, you look good. But uh, this is for young adults. You're on your honor. So please come forward here. Let's get a picture here. So come forward here. Let's get a little picture. This is camera, please. Come on in. Come on in. You're too far away. Get over here. What's that? Even distribution. Figure it out. Can you get that all, Chris? Thank you, young adults. God bless you.